Uh, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, uh, boys and girls, good afternoon. And very warm welcome from my side as well. Um, I'd like to thank our hosts here today uh, in this wonderful centre, art centre that used to be a place to build ships, and the city of Brest uh, for hosting us there. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. It's a wonderful place. And I've been also very, very lucky to be on board of the sailing boat that goes to Antarctica for the last five days. It's been a fantastic five days. So I'd like to thank Captain Mellis and uh, Head of Expedition, um, Teet, for taking me um, on the ship. And she's, she's a beauty, everyone can see her. She's just a short walk from here. So as Timo said, I'm going to talk a little bit like about climate change. What, what were we talking about? So, and where are we now? So what's the current situation? I'll start with that. And I add a little bit to that saying, how did we get there? So, and where do we want to go? And how do we get there? And the last question is most difficult out of um, these three questions. It's challenging. So I'd like to you I'd like you to look at this picture. It's a picture by NASA, um, taken seven about seven years ago. It was the first time NASA was able to construct a picture of our planet Earth during the night time. It's a beautiful picture. That's, that's what we have. We don't have anything else beside that planet. And 71% of that planet is covered by the ocean, because we are actually the ocean. It's beautiful. So what makes life possible on that planet? So how come we can live here? So this planet is home for 7.7 .7 billion people and 3 trillion trees. And every winter we have one septillion, septillion, uh, that means a trillion trillion snow crystals falling from the sky. The thing that makes life possible here is the greenhouse effect. So what is that? It's a very simple thing. So we know, all know that we have the sun that gives us light and warms the earth. So the light passes through the atmosphere. Some of the radiation is reflected back by the earth and by the atmosphere and by polar areas and, and so on. Some of it is trapped by the plant and radiated back as infrared radiation. And this radiation is then trapped by so-called greenhouse gases and reflected back to the Earth. So it's a simple thing. But what it does is it makes, makes life possible on this planet. Because without that simple effect here, the temperature on our planet would be Average temperature would be minus 18 degrees constantly. So we need greenhouse effect because it's a really, really good thing. So, and we're talking about greenhouse gases. We have actually talking about six groups of greenhouse gases. And carbon dioxide is the main one um, and the most important one out of, out of six. And the others are methane, emitted by agriculture, water. So, we have a beautiful planet. We have a really good thing called Krenos effect that makes life possible on our planet. So, and yeah, we talk, still we're talking about climate change. So, what is actually happening now? I'll give you some pictures. So, this picture is slightly blurry, but I hope you can see some trees here. These are called drunken trees. They look drunk because they kind of don't stand up and they're falling to all sorts of directions. 
So what has happened here? Did they go to party and on the way home now? Drinking too much last night? Actually, it's Siberia. We're looking at real trees that have started falling over because permafrost is melting. And their roots are too shallow, so they can't hold on on the earth anymore. And they're starting falling over. That's what climate change has been doing. We can see when you go to Yamal Peninsula in Russia, you can see pictures like that. These are holes, huge ground holes. The diameter of this hole, these holes can be up to 100 meters, and they're 60 meters deep. So what, what is that? Have there been some UFOs landing there? This is what the people, when they saw these holes, they were thinking that the aliens have been causing this. What actually happens again is melting permafrost, the underground lakes, the ice has been underground. I started melting. When ice melts, then methane emissions are trapped in the ice, finding the way to, to empty spaces on the earth, on the surface. So, and also, we have a lot of organic matter in permafrost that starts decomposing and also emits, the, there are also additional emissions, methane and, and CO2. So these melted or empty spaces on the ground, they fill with methane and cause huge explosions. These holes are actually very, very close to Russian gas fields. So I, I'll leave it to you to think what might happen. Um, not in a very far future. Another picture, you can see these white corals here. They shouldn't be white. They're not naturally white. That's the ocean. That's a great coral reef, a picture from them. So what has been happening here is that because of climate change, the ocean becomes more acidic. And corals, beautiful corals, become very stressed. So corals are filled with algae, and they spit them out when they get very stressed. But algae give corals food, so and they start to pack. And the acid also dissolves calcium, calcium carbonate. So the shells of clams and the body of Corals, they also start um, dissolving. Um, we also have corals in the far north, and they are much more more sensitive to, to climate change and acid and stress than um, than warm water corals. So they also suffering, and there are many more things happening in the oceans at the seas. Um, and uh, Jonna and Mern will tell you much, much more about what happens, what has been happening and what is happening now uh, due to climate change um, impacts. So oh, coral bleaching is, has already been affecting off of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, so. But of course, it's that it's the same greenhouse gas effect. So what has been happening that we said greenhouse gases are really good in the atmosphere, but the humans have been doing, we have started adding more and more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere by taking fossil fuels, that means dead plants and animals, to be more correct. Um, from the ground and burning and adding them to the global carbon cycle. And these emissions staying up in the atmosphere and causing just more warming. So warming is good, greenhouse effect is good, but you know, it's as with every good thing, 
too much is not always the best thing, isn't it? So, the current on average warming is about one degree, just to, just to be, feel it, how much it is. So when we talk about one degree, and that we're heading towards two degrees, as we will see very soon, then you may ask me, one degree is nothing, isn't it? So if you think of your own body, think of your body temperature, add one degree. How are you going to feel? Our biosphere is a very complicated system that lives in balance, and we're putting more heat into that. Climate change is not just the temperature. Temperature is only one consequence of, of climate change. So, so what has been really, really happening? We can see what we can see, as I said, like we, there's more greenhouse effect now, and we have been adding, as I said, more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Throughout history, we have had human history, humans as we are, the last about 12 to 15,000 years, the concentrations up in the atmosphere have been 280 particles per million, about. So between 260 and 280. So how do we calculate it very briefly? Um, you take um, water out of air, you calculate the molecules, and out of million, we have 280 CO2. So this is how we measure it, the greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. It's a simple thing. So water, of course, is itself is a greenhouse gas, as I said, and it magnifies the greenhouse effect. Um, so we can't forget that, but we just, for simplicity, let's just talk about CO2 and, and um, other greenhouse gases now. So, Currently, in average, in average uh, levels of 411 particles per uh, million. So, and we know from science that safe level is 350. We can still feed okay. We go so with that, that has very serious consequences. So if you add up all greenhouse gases, we close to 500 particles per million. So CO2 has been through history the gas that we have been adding most. So, um, and where, where do these greenhouse gases are coming really? Mostly, as I said, we're burning fossil fuels, most of them coming from energy use. And most of energy emissions are coming of, or not most, but they're almost half are coming from electricity and heat. And, And land use is also important. So cutting down forests, turning um, land or forests into farmland um, is very important, so 10 to 15 percent. And the oceans can emit when plants start dying, plants and animals, but they also are very good. They absorb carbon. They're trying to balance the system. Hence, we have this acidification, as you saw from the, one of the previous pictures. So that's the same, what I just said a couple of minutes ago. Most of the emissions are coming from energy use, and most of energy emissions, or large junk, is coming from electricity and heat and transport. So. And most of it is CO2. So I said um, we have started burning fossil fuels. We started doing it with the Industrial Revolution. And we are doing it at a decreasing speed. And when the Angler person company found oil, since then we are also using liquids, that means oil. And, and with oil, we also got <coughs> gas. So we're increasingly are using more and more energy.
Population also has been really growing fast. So if you think that from industrial revolution, that's the end of 18th century, when we had only 0.7 billion people on this planet, then now we have 7.7, 7, 10 times more. But we still have almost 1 billion in poverty. And they need to get richer. They need to have good lives. And to become richer, we need more energy, don't we? We need to burn more <coughs> fossil fuels. But the good news is that carbon intensity of our econo economies has started declining. What does, mean, what does this mean is that per unit of economic output, in your, when you produce something for one dollar, we're using now half less emissions. What is a really good um, news? So this is the picture showing you how population has been growing and has been really, really speeding up. And in about four or five years, we have eight, we'll have eight billion people on this planet. We all know about Black Death, that killed about 25% population on this planet. And you can see it's just a tiny tip there. It actually did not do much. World GDP, economic output per person, has a very similar shape. So we're 15 times richer now than we were during the times of Industrial Revolution. And the country's getting richer and richer. But still, you can see some countries still need to develop to catch up with others. You can see also how France has been developing, how France's economy grows and how, how fast it has been growing. So, and as I said, carbon intensity of this economic output has been declining. It's a funny graph because you need to kind of read it upside down a little bit. And then we have had several crises in this, um, in this world. And this is the census here. So you need to read this for this picture and the right one for this. Um, so the upside down is called the carbon intensity. So you can see that the recent global financial crisis really didn't do much in terms of um, CO2 emissions, and they're growing again. So, where do we want to go? In 1977, William Nordhaus, who's a US economist, wrote a paper. So he started building his economic models and he built models that also had energy use and emissions in, in them. So, um, and then he noticed that if we continue using fossil fuels for energy, then very soon the temperature increase will be more than two degrees. And then he also knew at that time from science that over the last 100,000 years, average temperature has not increased more than two degrees. And his conclusion from this paper was that we're heading towards unknown future. We don't know what's going to happen, but it's not going to be good for and he received a uh, Nobel Memorial Prize, uh, Memorial Prize in Economics uh, just last year for, for this work. Um, what he did in late um, 70s. And that's, that's the original, original graph from his original paper where he actually warns that we're going towards, towards more than two degrees. So, In 1992, countries came together 
As Simon also already mentioned that we have United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, where I'm really honoured to chair, chair, vice chair the Technology and um, Science Commission or body. And we have had it like for 17 years now. And in 2015, we had our Paris Agreement. Based on what we knew at that point, we decided that we want to keep the warming of our temperatures. Temperature increase below 2 degrees, above pre industrial levels. Um, and trying to, if possible, trying to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. Why, where the 1.5 came, because for some of the small island states in the Pacific, 2 degrees is end of their lives. That means sea level increase for them more than actually they can take, and more hurricanes, and more natural disasters for these people. So they were very firmly in Paris when we negotiated this. We're pushing for 1.5 degrees. So this is where we want to go. But we're not on track. So if you think back of the healing curve I showed you, the increasing emissions that we're now at 400 and, and 11 particles per, per million, then you didn't see any really decline in concentrations or stabilization of this concentration. So if we continue like this, then 1.5 degrees will be already warming around 2040. We're trying to find agreements. And now embarrassing, you think, we have tried to find an agreement and limit emissions since 1992. So how many years? I leave it to you to calculate. It's rather sad, I must say. But it's very, very difficult to get an agreement when we're dealing with such a vital thing that gives us energy, keeps people alive, makes them richer, allows more people to survive. But we continue working. So this just shows you the pledges and targets there are various agreements, pledges and targets. So you can see that we're very, very far from two degrees and we're very, very far from reaching one point five degrees with our current commitments. Hence, the concentrations will continue. But we're trying. We're trying our best. That's the work that UN is doing, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So we meet twice a year. So we have for science and technology body, we have had already 50 meetings. And now we have decided every time we meet, we put up the healing curve the emissions picture. Just to remind everyone, please guys, reach an agreement and start acting. Um, so, what we're trying to do, interestingly now, we have decided that just involving governments is not enough. We're bringing in indigenous knowledge, indigenous peoples, we're bringing in Inuits, we're bringing in Maoris to, to work with us at the UN, because they have amazing knowledge we could also use. So every little action matters. So we're trying to involve them. And they are now involved because that's the picture when we had a decision in, in Poland uh, at the uh, climate change negotiations last December. So how do we get there? We have to start very quickly limiting emissions. And the emissions have to reach zero, net zero. I'll explain a bit more about net zero. By around 2050. So everyone, everyone needs to be on board. And when we talk in the UN about non-state actors, then that means 
each of us. Companies, people. We can, I can bring you a very good example from, from our sailing, sailing boat. For example, all over the world, 25 years, 30% food is wasted. We have a very good chef on board who, who spends most of his time in Cali cooking and he does not waste food. So his aim is not to waste food. And that's his contribution, our contribution, our crew's contribution to limiting climate change. So we really need to act fast. And if I say that we need to have emissions to net zero by in the middle of the century, and we need to reduce significant emissions by 2030, then we really, not to increase 1.5 degrees, we really only have one to two decades. So 20, 10 to 20 years to sort out the problem. Um, and interestingly, it's not very expensive. It's, we only require 1% of global need, GDP needs to go to additional investments into clean energy, into clean technologies, low carbon technologies. And why the number is so small? If you think back on one of my previous slides I showed you, that only that's reducing electricity and heat is only 4% of our economic output, of our global GDP. So the additional investment is, is quite small, what we need. So we need really need to act now. So this is the same story in pictures, just telling you we have to reach net zero by around 2050. Some modeling exercise, scientists trying to find the pathways that take us there, that can actually limit um, global warming to, to one and half degrees. And this graph comes from the IPCC, that's also Timo talked about, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, recent assessment report from last year, that's the special report on limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees that was released where recently. Um, currently, well, recently in August, we more recently, we had an IPCC report on land and climate change. And next week, I will be in Monaco negotiating uh, climate change and oceans report, or actually it's the ocean, as I said before. The ocean um, and careers were in changing climate. So, if we don't, what happens if we don't reduce emissions really fast um, and don't develop new technologies? What happens then is that temporarily we increase the temperature more than over one and a half degrees. And we need to then find technologies to remove CO2 and other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. One of the ideas people have, um, or scientists have proposed, is to use unused land plant trees. Um, then it has to be actually reforestation, not deforestation. So deforestation, yeah. deforestation is a bad thing. <laughs> so, um, and that's one of the things, just plant more, more um, trees. The recent study again shows that trees, because trees take up CO2 when they grow and produce organic matter from that. So when it gets, the concentrations are going higher, then trees grow faster, but they also die sooner. So it not, might not be a solution. And we have this bio-net, this carbon capture storage. And the idea there is that we burn 
bio material. It can be like agricultural waste, but it also can be um, wood. So you can plant bio crops, um, fast growing trees, cut them, burn them. And what you then do is you take the CO2 from burning these materials, like either, either wood or agricultural waste. You cash it and you put it underground and then you close the hole and you hope that it will stay there. This technology is not quite here yet. So we're trying to do carbon caption storage for coal fire power plants, but we, we need up to like 10 to 20 gigatons capturing, capture, capturing every year, capturing greenhouse gases. Currently, we can only do 200 kilotons per year. Then, also one of the scenarios in IPCC report says that we need to change our consumption patterns. We need to have electric cars and electric electricity needs to come from renewable energy. Um, we need to waste less food. We need to do everything really, really we can do and change our behavior. Consume less. Reuse things. <coughs> so that each of us will, when we will change our behavior to really low, low carbon, then that would be one of the solutions. And according to the report, it would be best way of limiting global warming because the other way would be to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And as I just said, we don't have these ways. Yet, and the trees, planting more trees is a good thing, but very temporary solution. So the four scenarios are just here, yeah, just to you, for you to have a quick look. So uh, the first one is when we all change our behavior, um, consume less, um, don't, don't use anything that's fossil fuel based or fossil fuel energy based, fossil fuel based is not actually bad, uh, but just like burning and releasing greenhouse gases is bad. And then we change our land use um, policies and land use behavior, plant more trees, um, uh, don't cut down forests to, to grow more crops. And then the other scenario is saying, starting to use the bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. And the last scenario, what you can see is that it's up to 20 gigatons per year captured, and we buy 2100. Um, and uh, quite high levels already before uh, 2015. And we don't have the technology. It's not fully there. We have, in theory, we know how to do it. In practice, not really. So when we limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, that, that has many synergies with the other UN sustainable development goals in terms of health, clean energy, uh, clean cities, li livable cities, responsible consumption production, and also oceans is one of the UN sustainable development goals. Just one example, only Earth benefits only alone will be sufficient to compensate the cost of reducing emissions. And greatest benefits will be in India and China, the two countries with greatest, largest populations. And if any anybody has been to India, China, and the large cities, then you know what I'm talking about. They're not really livable in terms of air pollution, but reducing fossil fuels will also have additional benefits in terms of reducing, reducing air pollution. And this, that's more reducing air pollution. It's a study we did uh, now about already nine years ago. This is Mexico City. And we were looking when you reduced 80% of CO2 in Mexico City. Excuse me. 
So in terms of transport or uh, also um, power production, then from that production producing CO2 and other pollutants that come from burning fossil fuels, we will get about 7% reduction in surface ozone. Surface ozone is, ozone is poison. You can't smell it, but it kills you. And just from that, we could save uh, 1,500 lives per year. Less people dying from lung diseases. You can see also similar benefits was occurring in LA. Um, so, it's an interesting question that people often ask me, like, that's all like scientists and I didn't know what they're talking about. Uh, that's all made up. It's just to create like, more jobs for scientists, all this climate change talk. So it's literally, it's a lie. I could tell you much longer actually why it's not a lie, why it's science, and how many measurements we have that show, that show the concentrations and how they're measured. Um, about like thousands and thousands of year, years um, of data we have. So, but even if it is a lie, so what we're doing now, trying to achieve, gives us so many additional good things that that really doesn't matter anymore, isn't it? We're getting energy independent when we have renewable energy, wind energy. Uh, we, we saw today that um, the city of Brest has, um, has, has installed the first um, a generator, underwater electricity generator, that uses water currents. That's in a pilot project and they're hoping that, and it's privately funded, and they're hoping that this technology will be used by many other countries. And it's a stable source of energy, renewable energy. That's a really, really good example. Uh, country Costa Rica is now 100% on green energy. They don't have any fossil energy, but well, green electricity. They don't have any fossil-based electricity in the country anymore. Uh, Scotland closed coal power, power stations, the last ones, three years ago. Uh, in the UK, we have um, wind energy and solar energy is cheaper than coal energy, so we're doing great good. Um, so, but we need to do even more. So we have, then when we trying to address climate change, we have green jobs working in the renewable energy, like here in Brest. We have nice green cities, we have clean water, healthy children, so all this well done with just acting on, on climate change. It is a challenge, but it's a challenge worth taking. So we need technologies, we need all change the way we live. But we have the UN Charter and the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, where we promise, and these documents are like very, very, they're not new. Though. The Human Rights Declaration is 70 years old. And we promise in these documents that we allow our children and grandchildren to live in peace, in good health, and have everything they need for a happy life. So I think we need to fulfill this promise. Um, and as Chinese say, every crisis offers a golden opportunity. Let's just take it. Thank you.